Hello, welcome to my Kevin K. Zach channel. And first off in this video, part two of At the Preaching of Jonas, um, let me get my time started there. I would like to address the issue of hyperdispensationalism. Now, my previous video had a couple of thumbs down. Uh, some folks didn't like it, apparently. And I'm not going to go into naming any names, but let me state my position about hyperdispensationalism. First of all, what is hyperdispensationalism? When I throw that big long word out there, what do I mean by it? Well, a hyperdispensationalist, to me, is one who thinks that the church, the present church age, started with Paul, the Apostle Paul. Um, I have discussed this at length in previous videos, the seven dispensations, but the church age as we know it in this dispensation began in Acts chapter 2. Although, as I stated before, and this is a much deeper subject, and I do go into it somewhat in the other videos, um, the church being the body of Christ, since we're in Christ, the church is eternal. Now, I can't pretend to understand what all that means um, in my present mind, but for the purpose of, of this whole thing, um, in this dispensation, the church began in Acts chapter 2. Um, Paul mentioned those that were already in the faith. Now, an apostle is one who um, received revelation directly from the Lord Jesus. Um, he was one that was born out of time, so to speak, as he says. Um, and an apostle would have to be an eyewitness to the majesty uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul was. And Paul is indeed the apostle to the Gentiles. But a hyperdispensationalist is one who carries the thought too far under the guise of rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, they will say that Peter and Paul had two different gospels when nothing could be further from the truth. I have covered this extensively in uh, previous videos. So, um, I'm not going to do so again, but let me state publicly, for the record, that I hold no ill will towards hyper-dispensationalists, those who teach that Peter and Paul had a different gospel, those who cling to Paul, um, who, when they reached the pearly gates, would trample over Peter just to go see Paul. I don't have anything against you. I count you as brothers and sisters in Christ because... After all, you do believe the gospel that Paul preached, as do I. So, I'm not going to get into fiery debates with people on my comment uh, section of, of my videos. And, you know, if you want to give them a thumbs down, okay. At the end of the day, um, I still love you in the Lord. You're my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I don't think you're in some kind of weird cult um, because... You deny that Peter's gospel was the same as Paul's. Uh, I believe you are misguided because there is indeed one gospel. Okay, There is one faith, the Bible says, one hope, one baptism. Christ is in all of us. Okay, That's the whole point of my very lengthy teaching on the sons of God in the Old Testament. Uh, there are many people that teach also, and, and I would say that hyper-dispensationalists think along this line as well, that uh, Old Testament salvation was a combination of faith plus works. Um, I have gone at great lengths on this channel to stand for the truth and to show the fallacy of such a teaching. Um, people were not saved by works in the Old Testament. Um, the purpose of this, uh, at the preaching of Jonas, the last one and this one, is to show that it's God's work. You know, Jesus, the Bible says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. His own people 
of of his own nation by and large rejected him but as Paul says their eyes were blinded so that salvation could come to the Gentiles um, we've been grafted in to that tree and the picture of Nineveh and the preaching of Jonah is a wonderful story that should never be overlooked where God graciously lovingly extends his mercy to the, the men and women and children of Nineveh and he doesn't destroy them because all of them believed I mean what a revival they went from unbelievers to believers and I'm telling you that um, they will be in the kingdom of God and one of the things that I want to get into today a little bit is um, the gospel of the kingdom versus the gospel of grace well it's the same gospel and I'm going to show some scripture on that and try to go through the thought process there if the Lord uh, gives me the right words to say but meanwhile <clears throat> back to Jonah I want to show you the long suffering and patience and kindness of the Lord Jesus who in the Old Testament is known as Jehovah now, let's turn back to uh, Jonah once again. And you would think I could find this book by now. Uh, and let's, let's turn to chapter 4. First of all, we have the words of Jonah. He says, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. So he went and did the job that God told him to do, and they repented. They weren't supposed to do that. Jonah was not happy about the whole thing, because he went outside the city, and he wanted to see them all get destroyed. Um, verse 2, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. He said, I knew you'd change your mind. You're a great, gracious, kind God, a loving God, and I knew you was going to change your mind. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Poor Jonah. How wretched he must have felt. This whole city got saved, and he couldn't even enjoy it. They was all Gentiles. And, um, you know, being the Jew that he was, they, he was jealous uh, of the Lord God. He didn't apparently want to share them with any Gentiles. So... He was so distraught, he asked God to kill him, which kind of reminded me of Elijah, but under different circumstances. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? Just a question. But you know, he gets asked these questions, and Jonah doesn't really answer them. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. He is still hoping that he'd see fire come down from heaven and consume the whole city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. See, God was still being kind to Jonah in spite of his uh, wrong spirit in the matter. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die 
and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Now, right here, folks, I want you to understand the kindness and mercy of God. You see, God is not affected by man's emotions. Okay? He says, I am the Lord, I change not. He doesn't get all worked up into a feverish pitch because people do. He doesn't change. He's unchangeable. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. God even had mercy on the cattle. You know, I cannot understate the importance of the lesson of Jonah, because those people of Nineveh were Gentiles, were Gentiles. Um, and God is merciful to us Gentiles. And what I want you to realize is that God's program has been going along since day one. You know, even before the foundation of the world, before the creation, God knew that his son was going to die. He knew that man, his creation that he made in his own image, would fall into sin and they'd need a savior. And that's why I say, when you go back over here to verse 10 of chapter 3, it says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. God repented him of the evil. He changed his mind. But what I want you to understand is, our God already knew what they were going to do. He already knows all that. He doesn't sit up there wringing his hand saying, Oh, I wonder if this great city of Nineveh is going to receive me or not and receive my preacher Jonah that I'm sending. Or if I'm going to have to wipe them all out in 40 days, just like I said. Huh, no. God already has all that figured out. He can see all of time transpire in but a moment. He can see everything before him, all of man's history, these 6,000 years plus a millennium that is yet to come. He can see all these things, that which we can't even see, that this book just barely gives us a glimpse of. You know, we can look forward to a millennium where we have glorified eternal bodies and the lion shall lay down with the lamb and a child shall lead them. Which, by the way, is a reconciliation of the two natures of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is both the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, and he is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And you can't separate that, because he is both. Um, he is the precious Lamb of God that, that saves us from our sins, that cleanses us from all unrighteousness, and he is that fierce lion of the tribe of Judah that comes down in Revelation 19 swooping upon the enemies and those that hate him to exact vengeance upon them in his fierce day of wrath. I wonder about that day because Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty, is going ahead of us, you know, on his white horse coming out of the sky, and we're behind him. We don't face him with this fierceness and wrath. He puts us back behind him, his bride. So, it is the world that sees the fierceness of his wrath, not us. Because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk according to the Spirit. And 
as new creatures in Christ, as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, I want you to understand that uh, this, this awesome God that we serve, He's the same yesterday and today and forever. He doesn't change. He's always had one gospel. He knows that every man that's ever lived could never get to heaven by their own works. Abraham didn't. Isaac didn't. Job didn't. People are righteous because God declares them righteous. Because he transfers his righteousness to them so that when they look upon us, or when God the Father looks upon us, he sees the righteousness of his Son. We are clothed with the righteousness of God. So, that idea is further explained in Philippians 3.9, which says, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So, here's a question. Do you want your own righteousness? Keep the law. Do you want the righteousness of Christ? Put your faith in Him. It is only by trusting in Him, believing in Him. And as I showed before, uh, believing and repenting are so interwoven together you can't separate them. It's not a step-by-step -step process. Salvation is that which occurs in a moment of time. That moment when you believe, that moment when you put your trust in Him. But there are some that come along and foolishly mock uh, believing. And they try to make it so much more. They try to complicate the gospel. Now, I'm not saying that every one of those people are, are lost. Some don't understand. But when you come face to face with a person who twists the scripture to make things fit into their own little scheme of things, instead of thus saith the Lord and letting scripture speak for itself, then you run into a whole host of problems. And more often than not, when you do some investigating on that person, you see over time where their doctrine has slipped. You see where it has failed where it is not grounded and rooted firmly in the Word of God. It might just be a little tidbit here, a little tad there, but pretty soon it's a landslide of false doctrine just going down the mountainside at 90 miles per hour. And they will crash at the bottom. Because if they love that false doctrine, that's where they're going. They're going to crash. And one particular person that comes to mind that I've dealt with many times, um, you know, he had taught that um, it was salvation by faith plus works in the Old Testament during the tribulation, salvation by works alone in the millennium, no faith needed, just works. I knew it was a matter of time before this man would slide and then he comes out with a parable about a poor man and a rich man stating how the poor man needed help he needed he needed the rich man to help him and this rich man was the only one that could do it so he goes to the rich man he called upon him and the rich man <laughs> smelled his clothes to make sure he wasn't smoking or didn't smell like alcohol and after the man promised to to faithfully serve him for the rest of his life, i.e. bargaining, you know, let's make a deal. The rich man says, okay, I'll help you. Folks, that is sad. That is most grievous because my Bible says something totally different. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, Christ died for the ungodly he didn't wait for us to get better. He didn't wait for us to fix ourselves. You know, that poor man going to call upon the rich man to get help, he's like, okay, I'm gonna be doing this in a week, so I better put away the cigarettes and the alcohol and, and work on myself a little bit. Um, maybe go get a haircut, 
get on some better clothes. I've got to impress this guy. I've got to get a good impression, a good first impression. That is the world view, okay? God already knew about you from before the foundation of the world. Do you really think you're going to fool him? Do you really think you're going to be something uh, that he can't just see right through? Uh, it's, it's absolutely ludicrous. And then the same person comes out with, and I knew it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen before it ever happened. He had to come out with possible exceptions to eternal security in this dispensation. Which was, if you don't believe the King James Bible, and um, if you hate the Jews. Now, folks, you know, it's not a wise thing to hate the Jews. And you should love the King James Bible. I do. Um, but some people, particularly new believers, may not understand all that. Um, you have to back off and, and allow... God to work in people's lives and to grow them. That's his job. Okay? If God has called you to teach the word, you just teach the word and let the word that's being taught speak to that person. So, I knew it was going there. Why? Because error begets error. It does every time. Without fail. So, Let's see what other notes I have here. One of the things that I want to cover is found over in Luke 17. Luke 17. Let's go over there. Luke. Luke 17. Verse 20 and 21. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, boy, when he was demanded of the Pharisees, you know, that just makes me cringe to think that the Pharisees, so proud and self-righteous and arrogant, would demand something of God. Kind of reminds me of atheists today. Very demanding. Um, a lot of people are demanding of God. Uh, it'd probably be a good idea, and it would behoove us not to be demanding of God, but rather to seek out His will and uh, let Him tell us what needs to be done. But as it is with the King James Bible, every word is there for a reason. And when He was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, He answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, very simply, the kingdom of God is this. That seed of the gospel, remember the parable of the seed and the sower that went forth to sow the seed? Um, that's sowing the gospel for the kingdom of God. When people get saved, they're in the kingdom of God. They're part of God's kingdom. You can be in God's kingdom or you can be in the devil's kingdom. Okay, The God of this world, the devil, has blinded the eyes of, of those that follow him. But not so with the children of God. So, the kingdom of God, quite simply, is the same as um, the gospel, the, the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of grace are the same gospel. You see, it is that salvation, that seed that is planted within you, that, that seed of faith that grows, that mustard seed that starts out so very tiny and grows over time. So, I had some other notes about this. Now, Jesus does return to set up a physical kingdom, okay? I want you to understand that. Yes, it does apply to the physical kingdom that Jesus sets up, but the physical kingdom is a shadow of that which is to come. It's a shadow of the spiritual kingdom. Let's think about this for a minute. 
Let's turn over to Matthew 8. Matthew 8. Matthew chapter 8. And let's look at verses 11 and 12. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. A couple points I want to say about this. First of all, a Jew doesn't automatically go to heaven just because they're a Jew, because they're the physical seed of Abraham. Um, the Bible makes this very clear. But where so many people get off on the wrong tangent with this is they start hating the Jews. And that's wrong. Paul makes it very clear that we're to pray for the Jewish people. And uh, if you get on my channel and you start talking a bunch of anti-Semitic stuff, um, your comments will be deleted. I'm not going to tolerate it. But also there's something else that I want you to see here. Where he says in verse 11, that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now this is during the millennium. What I want you to realize is that we come back with Jesus Christ to rule and reign with him for the thousand years. But all of us have glorified eternal bodies. But these people coming from the east and west, and as it says, over in Luke 13, 29, also uh, the north and the south. So these Gentiles come from all over to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who have resurrected bodies. So you're going to have people in, in just normal physical bodies like you and I have right now, along with uh, those who have eternal glorified bodies like we're going to have someday. So... That kingdom of heaven that we see there um, is the beginning of the fulfillment of eternity. In the millennium, you have a, a, a new transition period. You have uh, resurrected saints and glorified eternal bodies from all the previous dispensations there. Uh, and ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ. Working on his behalf. Um, and in that day, my friends, in that day with a glorified eternal body, we'll be able to keep all 613 of God's laws perfectly. Um, I had read that there are 613 laws in the Old Testament. And one of the things that was on the priest's garment on the border was a pomegranate. Um, actually, it alternates between a bell and a pomegranate. Well, a pomegranate seed has, uh, or the inside of a pomegranate has 613 seeds, according to what I read. And that is representative of each and every one of the laws of God. And in that day, uh, we'll be able to keep all the law perfectly, without error. Uh, it's going to be a marvelous time in that day. But always, always, whenever I... Uh, try to teach something from the Word of God, I like to take a step back and look at the eternal perspective, to look at the bigger picture. Don't get so narrowly focused on just the here and now uh, that you can't see the eternal. Learn to look at things through God's eyes, the way God sees them. He sees all of man's history before him at the same time. There is nothing hidden from him. There is nothing that can be hidden from him. So, What I want to say in closing is that there is one gospel. There's only been one gospel. Man has never been saved by any works. Um, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. It's not going to happen. No one has ever been justified by keeping the law. What is the purpose of the law? Paul says that the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. You see, the law is a mirror, and it is a mirror that 
when you hold it up in front of you, it helps you to see your sinfulness. And the purpose of that is to bring you to Christ so that uh, you will repent and believe in Him. And by the way, let me uh, show a verse that ties in repentance and believing all together. It happens at the same time. Let's turn over to Mark. Mark chapter 1, I believe. Listen to this. Verse 15. And saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. See, repent ye and believe. It's a thing that happens all at the same time. In a moment of time. Um, when you start getting tracks and different things, uh, it can get confusing for some people because it has the step-by-step -step process and then this little sinner's prayer that you pray at the end of it. Um, and yet, when you talk to people about it, uh, you don't quite go, okay, well, you got to do this. Step two, you got to do this. Step three. You know what? You're not going to have that much time with some people. You tell them very simply, repent and believe the gospel. Put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ today, right now. It's the hour of salvation. Don't wait until tomorrow. And you also have to tell them about the harsh reality of hell. Uh, it is very important that people understand that um, if they reject the gospel, where they're going to go, where they're going to spend eternity. There's no point in sugarcoating it, friends. Um, the sad fact of the matter is so many uh, people today sugarcoat it and, and get it down to the point where um, they don't want to offend anybody. Well, by and large, the gospel is going to be very offensive to a whole lot of people. Um, I've offended quite a number of Jehovah's Witnesses that have showed up to my door and even a few Mormons. I happen to live in a part of a neighborhood where I get these kind of visitors on a regular basis. And so in that brief exchange of words, I explained to them that you teach that Jesus Christ is not God and you've changed the nature of God. You, you do not believe in the God of this book. And that's a very important thing. Um, furthermore, you do not teach that man can be saved by faith alone and your cult. You need to believe, put your trust in Jesus Christ alone, not in your organization. The Watchtower Tract and Bible Society cannot save you. Um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, as founded by Joseph Smith in 1830, it cannot save you. A person, the one person who can save you is Jesus Christ. Put your trust in Him. Because if you don't, there's a coming judgment. And God is going to judge you according to your works. Because you don't have Christ's work. You don't have his finished work on the cross. His blood covering your sin to pay for it. So you don't have to get real elaborate. Um, the gospel has to be simple enough for a child to understand. And when people start saying, little children can't get saved... I have a problem with that because I was saved when I was 10. So I know that's wrong. Um, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and close this video for now. And if I come up with some more things to talk about along this line of thought, I'll be happy to make a part three. But until then, God bless and take care.